Hey, I'm still trying to find actors for my short film. What's up? It's the Culture Detective here investigating your favorite movies. And today I'm going to do a movie review on Tenkoku to Jinkoku, which literally means heaven and hell. But the official English title is High and Low, and it is a film from 1963 directed and co-written by the one and only legendary Kurosawa Akira. So uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I am resuming my Kurosawa binge. If you don't know what my Kurosawa binge is, it is um, back in 2021, ever since May, I believe, I started watching one Kurosawa film per month. Starting off, I watched Seven Samurai. Of course, you have to start with the big one, the most well-known Seven Samurai, and it is an exhilarating epic of samurais and fighting and thinking and planning and it is uh, a very good entrance to the cinema of Kurosawa. And then I watch Rashomon which is also a film that's kind of a classic from his and while I think Rashomon is really inventive and uh, as far as a film from the 1950s go it's really ahead of its time. I didn't enjoy the movie as much as I hoped I would same goes for the film Throne of Blood, which I thought is brilliant in that it is a Japanese twist of the classic Shakespearean tale that is uh, Macbeth. And I really like Macbeth, but Throne of Blood is just kind of uh, very slow in the first half in a way I didn't really enjoy it as much. But then in September, I watched Ikiru, which is honestly one of the best films I've ever watched in my life. It is enlightening, it is powerful, and um, if you think Kurosawa can only make samurai films, well, you're wrong because he makes some really good modern films as well. Then we have the movie The Hidden Fortress, which is a very fun, playful, sort of this samurai slash just a jitaigeki kind of film, period film. And then I watched The Bad Sleep Well, which completely blew my mind. It has elements of political thriller and film noir in it, and it's so much fun. And I ended this series of binging with Yojimbo, I think at the end of December, near the end of December, or I think near the end of November, I finished it with Yojimbo, which I think is a really solid movie with a lot of interesting moments. I can totally see why uh, Sergio Leone would go on to remake this but uh, Kurosawa so far has been one of my favorite directors of all times and there is no denying in that. Now one film in particular that I've been dying to watch that I've been wanting to watch that I've been hearing all the good things about is High and Low. A two and a half hour long, exhilarating, intense police procedural full of phone calls and investigation. Oh my god, this seems very interesting. So going into this movie, I had really, really freaking high expectations. And uh, that is not what you want to do. No matter if you're watching just a regular movie or a really great movie, never have I, never have high expectations. Because if your expectations are too high, then you will end up not enjoying the movie as much as I, as you hope you would. Which is kind of what happened to me last night. So I decided to, you know what, maybe I was just kind of uh, sleepy last night when I watched it. That's why I didn't really enjoy it to the fullest. So I actually rewatched some of the scenes earlier this morning to sort of re-solidify my impression of this movie. And I ended up enjoying this and appreciating this film a lot more. High and Low is actually a story in three acts. In the first act, we are introduced to Mr. Gondo, played by the one and only legendary Mifne Toshiro. So Mr. Gondo, Gondo-san, he is the executive manager of the National Shoe Company of Japan. He's really rich, he's really successful, he's really wealthy, and he's living a life of luxury. Now, it starts off with him basically beefing with three other guys who are also involved with the company. And so he secretly came up with a plan to buy more share of the company so that he can sort of, you know, kick these three guys out, all that stuff. But all that stuff does not matter. For the rest of the movie, 
all that stuff you just watched doesn't matter, not really. He suddenly receives a phone call saying that a kidnapper has kidnapped his son and he has to pay three, 30 million yen in order to take back his son. But as it turns out, his son is alive and well. Turns out the kidnapper didn't kidnap his son. The kidnapper kidnapped his Schaefer's son. He kidnapped the wrong person. And so the entire act one is basically the police secretly sneaking into the house. Gondo, the Schaefer, Gondo's wife and Gondo's assistant, all in that house, all mainly in that living room, waiting for phone calls. And that is basically the first 45 minutes of the film. It just takes place in one location. And uh, first of all, this movie is in 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. And I don't watch a lot of movies that have this aspect ratio. And at first when I watched it, I thought, hold on, hold on. Is this, is this the wrong format? Like, am I watching a, a compressed, squeezed version? Because when the Criterion logo was loading, usually, usually it was a circle. But for this film, it's flat. And I don't know why is it. And I, and I thought the whole film was just compressed and squeezed for some reason. But turns out the aspect ratio for this film is actually seriously 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. I've seen a lot of um, filmmakers, really artsy filmmakers, use aspect ratios that are skinnier than than the usual 16 by 9 so you know 1.37 to 1 4 4 to 3 aka 1.33 to 1 or a 1 to 1 i mean look at mommy but using this aspect ratio implies a lot of things now why did kurosawa use such a fat ratio well well that's actually a really great decision on kurosawa's part because this film relies heavily on blocking, involving many characters. And so in order to use blocking to its fullest, Kurosawa used this ratio so that you can see multiple human figures and multiple human heads in the same frame. And so this aspect ratio actually worked really well. That brings to my next point about this film, and that is the blocking of this film is some of the best I've ever seen in cinema. The placements of every single character in every single scene and every single shot is so met meticulously crafted. They all look really good and they're all so full of spaciness. If you take the same script and bring it to a different director, it would turn out really freaking boring because after all, high and low on paper actually sounds kind of boring. The first 45 minutes is just a bunch of people in a room waiting for phone calls. And then there is like a 10 minute scene in the middle of the movie where it's just a bunch of policemen listing out evidence, talking about their investigation, reporting to the chief police. It's kind of boring on paper actually, but because it's Kurosawa with the help of blocking, editing, cinematography, and acting, he manages to make this very freaking entertaining for some reason, and that's actually very impressive. Now again, the entire first act takes place all in a room, which seems kind of anticlimactic, it seems kind of not dramatic, not exciting, not eventful, but with the acting and the tight dialogue and the blocking, it's still very exciting. And there are also a few scenes that I really love. The first time the phone rings in front of the police and the police chief is like, okay, get the phone upstairs. And then they, they picked up the phone and they're recording it secretly. And there's a curtain scene where Gondo has to prove that the policeman isn't in his house, so he has to open the curtains and the policeman immediately hid under the table. That That is a sick scene, that is sick. Then we have act two, of course, we have the train sequence, which is just amazing. I love a good train sequence in a film noir. I love a good train sequence. And then we have the scene where Aoki, aka the Schaefer, takes, taking his son out. Uh, in order to recall how he was kidnapped. Um, that was a interesting scene that has led to some interesting developments. And of course, we have the 10 minute long scene where we are in a police station and we're, we're just looking at a bunch of policemen listing evidence. And that is basically the whole scene. But by injecting actual footage of something else, it 
it, it just flows a lot smoother. Finally, we have Act 3, which is basically a, a hellish, hellish act. Because in Act 3, the policeman tried to catch the kidnapper. And in order to do that, they had to ask a lot of questions, go to a lot of places, hide, and do all that stuff. And because they have to do all that stuff, in a way, this film showcased the underbelly of Japan, of the Japanese society, with uh, bars and, and a bunch of junkies and dirty alleyways and brothels and all these, uh, all these streets. And we really get to see that, and that's really cool. And we also have a very uh, reasonable and logical ending, I guess, if that makes sense. Now, one thing I want to point out is that this movie has little to no music. It has music, but it uses it so sparingly. Most of the film is completely silent, uh, with dialogue on top and sound effects, of course. But there is no music. And there are both pros and cons to this, I guess. Uh, when it comes to pros, it is that we, the viewers, are allowed to soak in the drama the way Kurosawa wants us to. And it just really, really works. Some of the intense moments feel intense because it has no music. But occasionally I do want to hear a bit of music in the back just to make the movie feel even smoother and nicer and more immediate and straightforward. But I do respect Kurosawa's choice of making this film mostly without music. Now, I guess one of the reasons why I didn't enjoy this film as much as I wanted to is because of The Bad Sleep Well, which is a movie that came out before High and Low and a movie that I watched before High and Low. And The Bad Sleep Well completely blew my mind. I guess out of all the Kurosawa films I've seen, my favorite one would have to be Ikiru, but the one that blew my mind the most is actually The Bad Sleep Well, because I went into the movie knowing nothing. And people don't talk about The Bad Sleep Well all that much. So I just thought, okay, maybe it's just going to be an okay movie. And I was so wrong. The Bad Sleep Well is... I've, I've never seen a more interesting and exhilarating movie from Kurosawa. With so many twists and turns. It's basically film noir plus political thriller. Two of my favorite genres mixed together with a morally ambiguous main character with very evil antagonists. You just get into the story and you enter this world of lies and secrets and conspiracies and the ending is just, oh my God. So obviously after watching The Bad Sleep Well, I have really high expectations for a modern Kurosawa film because I know Kurosawa can make a damn great, damn amazing, fantastic modern film. That is not uh, period samurai stuff. And uh, High and Low is actually uh, different. So if you go into High and Low thinking that it's similar to The Bad Sleep Well, no, it's not. High and Low is uh, a lot more straightforward. It doesn't have as many twists or turns. And that was, I guess, one of my issues with High and Low. It's not really an issue. It's just I wish there was some sort of plot twist to it, maybe. Maybe uh, the three guys that... Mr. Gondo was beefing with in the beginning. Maybe they are somehow involved with the kidnapping. But then come to think of it, if that's the case, that would kind of ruin the purpose of the whole movie because the movie isn't about conspiracies and lies and secrets. This whole movie is based on a moral dilemma. And so the kidnapping and the beefing and the company literally has nothing to do with each other. Literally has nothing. It literally has no connection. And that's also kind of the point. What if you really need money and then suddenly someone kidnapped your son allegedly and uh, extorts you for money what 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 if what if that happened what would you do and that movie is sort of about that dilemma specifically and uh yeah i guess uh as a police procedural this is a fantastic movie as a neo-noir it is amazing as a societal examination of japanese society in the 60s it's really well done it is exhilarating, it is smart, it is well written, it is straightforward, it's kind of artsy, but also kind of, you know, people in general would also enjoy it. So uh, it's a really great movie, and it's definitely one of the best movies I've ever watched. I'm going to rewatch it again, 
maybe I'll love it even more after we watch, maybe it'll blow my mind even more, and theoretically it should blow my mind because it has just it just has so many great moments. Even the blocking alone should be mind-blowing enough for me. But uh yeah, so far this is really great. This is a great movie and I highly recommend it to anyone. Yeah. I'm giving High and Low a 10 out of 10. So, have you watched High and Low? From what did I know, did you rate it, like, or like it, and subscribe if you want more? And thanks for watching. Oh, also, um, High and Low is Heaven and Hell, Tenkoku to Jinkoku, and in a way that sort of symbolizes the heaven, that is the first act, the transition between heaven and hell, that is the second act, and hell, that is the third act. And it's also called High and Low because Mr. Gondo literally lives on top of a mountain while the kidnapper lives in the underbelly of Tokyo. And so that's sort of like, you know, symbolism. Anyways, thanks for watching. Subscribe if you want more.